if you don't need either, then keep it on and it'll be in whatever language you're speaking in. Bienvenidos todos a, al evento antes de, de empezar. Eh, no más Welcome más... to this event. Before we start, some housekeeping announcements. If you need interpretation, you can go to the I, uh, globe at the bottom of, uh, of the screen and choose your, the language of your preference. And if you speak both languages, you can just stay on the floor. Thank you. I will now welcome the event. Thank you the panel to the panelists too for their time and expertise today. This webinar is the fifth of our series of webinars titled Decades of Damage Done, the Drug Catastrophe in Latin America and the Caribbean. The previous discussions were focused on a first event, for example, to talk about the impact of prohibition and the war on drugs in Latin America and the Caribbean. Another one was about forced eradication of crops for their illegal use. Another one about how the war on drugs lead, led to a prison crisis in the region. And the last event was about how the anti-drug mission of the armed forces actually threatens human rights and alters the very delicate civil military equilibrium of democracies. This event today is mainly about how illegal traffic in drugs is the main source of income for organized crime groups and a very important driver for corruption in the region and also at an international level. And now I'm going to switch to English and then I will introduce the speakers and move on to the Q&A. and policymakers have pointed to the illicit drug trade as a main driver of corruption globally with a profit scale that is unmatched by other illicit activities. Current Assistant Secretary for the State Department's Bureau of International Narcotics and Law Enforcement, Todd Robinson, recently be affirmed before the U.S. Senate that while corruption takes many forms and stems from many sources, wealth on this scale gives transnational criminal organizations an almost unlimited capacity to corrupt government institutions and guarantee themselves more secure operating environments." End quote. Illicit drugs cross through official ports of entry, internal checkpoints, and airports, all with the active collusion of members of security forces, border and customs agencies, and politicians at all levels. Prohibition was originally intended to create a so-called drug-free world. In reality, what we've seen is decades of intense global commitment to prohibition and the war on drugs has shown vast growth in the scale and harms of illegal drug markets. For those willing to operate outside the law, illegal drug market participation can be enormously lucrative, generating immense profits that enhance the power of criminal enterprises to wield violence and to intimidate, corrupt, and infiltrate state institutions. In Latin America, drug prohibition has provided dependable fuel for organized crime and corruption, generating an incalculable toll of bloodshed and undermining the rule of law and democratic institutions. In what is commonly termed the balloon effect, US-backed drug control efforts have resulted in shifts in where plant-based and synthetic drugs are produced, as well as the countries that service transit, as traffickers simply adjust their supply chains and routes to adapt to enforcement pressures, as well as to meet market demand. Today's discussion will again look, take a closer look at some of the dynamics that are linking the drug trade with organized crime and corruption in the region. We're going to have three rounds of questions to examine both the historic roots of the problem, followed by a discussion of the current situation and its impacts, and then a more forward looking round looking at what can and should be done in the short to medium to long term. This is clearly a vast topic with many angles, and we're not going to be able to explore all of them today but I'm confident that our experts will provide an essential overview of these issues. So I'm gonna present them quickly and then we'll start with the round of questions. Um, I'm gonna do this in, in Spanish. Ricardo Vargas Mesa is sociologo con estudios en maestría. Ricardo um, Vargas Mesa has uh, studied from the University of Colombia. He's associate research from uh, in Holanda and part of his Mutop. His most recent paper is uh, War Economies, Drugs in Colombia and Threats to Peace. He's the author of several books, uh, reports and articles on illegal drugs, drug policy, alternative development and its relation to the Colombian conflict. He is a political science PhD by the Sorbonne University in Paris and he's also 
He's also he has more than 10 years uh, researching and analyzing violence in Mexico. We would also like to welcome Julie Lopez. She's a research journalist and independent journalist in Guatemala, where she also works for El Faro. Lopez is a specialist in drug trafficking, gangs, and migration, and she her work has been published by several international media. In 2016, she published in Mexico El Sapo Guzman, activities of Sinaloa cartel in Guatemala. So I'm going to start with the questions first. If in the participants would like to ask questions to the speakers, we would like to uh, kindly request them to use the Q&A function in Zoom, and we will try to answer all your questions at the end of our presentations. The first question is for Ricardo, and it has to do with Colombia. And I would like to talk a little bit about history. In 1989, Walla published the first international report Colombia besieged to document uh, the emergence of paramilitary groups and the merits of convenience that emerged. The paramilitary groups they supported became the driving force behind political violence in the country and also morphed into alliances at the local level between political and economic elites and criminal organizations. In order to begin with, the, with this conversation, can you help us understand this history and how these alliances have evolved over time? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you very much. And thanks for the invitation. I'd like to note that in the initial alliance involving the presence of paramilitary groups and regional powers, there's an issue, which is the accumulation of land, which as I see it is the main factor behind the uh, uh, narco trafficker paramilitary alliance. That accumulation of lands required means of protection and so local and regional political power and political forces played a key role and there a symbiotic relationship evolved for that was a functional to the action to the actions whereby the use of force by paramilitary force in many localities became a mechanism to ensure a vote buying in the regions, allowing for the politicians to, by this means, become elected. And it, it reached the point where Mancuso, a paramilitary leader, noted that 33% of the members of the National Congress of Colombia had been elected by those forces from those regions. Now, for the paramilitaries, the transaction was such that the presence of these political figures in the Congress would guarantee legislation and measures of protection, particularly in relation to extradition, more benevolent treatment, the possibility of having an agreement that would guarantee them benefits and that would uphold their interests. It should be noted that in any event, these uh, transactions of, were varied from region to region. That is say, there are some particularities. For example, if we go to the Lower Atrato, uh, the Lower Atrato region, uh, River region, funds from drug trafficking were used to either buy up lands illegally or to secure lands violently. The armed forces participated in this. They were providing protection to those structures, fighting the influence of guerrilla forces that were in these areas. So there, a dynamic came into being in which you had drug trafficking with interests in money laundering, money laundering, which was based on the accumulation of land. And uh, in addition, there was the forced displacement primarily of black communities from this region through the use of violence. and. At the same time, the participation of the state forces with a narrative associated with the armed conflict 
and the need to fight the guerrilla forces, which were somehow disturbing this whole process. They were able to go forward in this process of accumulation of land, displacement of population, consolidating the whole strategy in relation to these territories. And on the other hand, one can observe how in the case of Boyaka and Meta, those departments, uh, figures such as Victor Carranza came about. He was associated with contraband trade in emeralds, at which he appeared to be a businessman with very legitimate relations with political relationships at the regional and national level. But he was key in the structuring of paramilitary groups with uh, designing a whole process for accumulation of plans that was quite striking. I can give the example of just one farm with 25,000 hectares in the hands of Victor Carranza. And this is more or less the scale uh, of the sort of packs that unfolded in so many of these territories. And finally, I should note that in this phase of the uh, articulation between paramilitary forces and politicians, there was a modality and explicit agreements s signed by politicians and paramilitaries. And this was a modality that made it quite clear of the f that there was financing of relationship between paramilitary groups and politicians and in terms of the judicial action that came uh, later to investigate these facts those situations in respect of which these documents have come up with signatures spelling out commitments were used later for prosecu uh, prosecuting many of these politicians and many of them were actually convicted because of their participation in these kinds of processes. And in that case, one can observe that there was significant uh, developments from, by the judiciary and it was possible to indict, uh, prosecute and punish those, many of those who became involved in such dynamics. Now, in uh, I think we're in another question you'll put to me later on, we can see uh, how those processes evolved in relations to the whole uh, narco-trafficking paramilitary dynamic. Thank you very much. Let us turn to Mexico and then uh, Central America. I have a question. I'm going to put it to you in English. Mexico. Well, we see that there have been networks established to traffic illicit substances substances for several decades, right? almost a, a century now in Mexico. But there were major U.S.-led interdiction efforts that started in the 1980s that really, you know, closed off Florida as a main entry point for Colombian cocaine and changed the landscape. In, in Mexico of, of drug trafficking. And if you could just sort of walk us through, you know, how today's, the face of organized crime today in Mexico is different from that that we saw in the latter half of, of the 20th century. What does this current landscape look like in Mexico? And then talk a little bit about all the different illicit activities that organized criminal groups are, are currently involved in in Mexico. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you for the for the invitation. Um, I think the the question of the evolution of, of, of criminal groups in Mexico is actually um, very interesting to put in into perspective with the Colombian case, bearing in mind all the differences, of course, in the in the context, the political context, um, the armed counter context. But basically, what I think is important about the evolution and what you said about the evolution of illicit markets and, and drugs in Mexico is first an evolution that, that is extremely strong towards criminal groups that don't necessarily and not only participate in um, the drug trafficking business. Like most of the big criminal groups in Mexico do have active participation in drugs business and they're probably uh, for the most powerful of them today, Jalisco Nueva Generación, the Sinaloans, different, um, different groups. Um, they have, of course, uh, an active role in the, in the drug trafficking business, but you have like 
an expansion towards other illicit markets that does not only goes through um, the explanation of the diversification of criminal markets. I think in terms of how the illicit and the illicit markets actually work in, Mexi in, 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 in Mexico, the corruption works in Mexico, the power of violent groups in general, in terms of territorial control, land control, the way Ricardo was mentioning it about, about Colombia is extremely important, extremely, um, extremely interesting. So basically you have drugs that yes, keep on um, coming through Mexico, that keep on being produced and probably produced more and more um, in Mexico with the synthetic drugs being um, the uh, kind of booming um, industry, both in terms of export to the US, but also an, 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 a rising and growing issue of consumption in, in Mexico as well. So you have this value of drugs, of course, a huge market, tons of money pouring in, in, in the country, but I think the evolution goes towards something that is in between Colombia in terms of uh, the reality of multiple organization, the way they're rooted in, in certain territories, Michoacán again, Sinaloa, Durango, um, Guerrero a lot, but also an evolution that goes way more towards something that could be understood in Italian terms of mafia, basically. So the evolution is not only about how you get into different activities, but also the way you basically change the nature of your participation into local politics and local powers. And it looks a lot like very classic explanation and definition of the mafia as the business of extortion and protection, basically. So you, the, the groups in Mexico and the most uh, sophisticated ones, but also the, the like very small, uh, not so cartel-like groups are very much into, again, like the business of extortion and protection at the local level, basically offering an, a strange and worrisome protection that basically offers to protect you from a threat that you're actually the one uh, exerting against your business, against your activity, against your shop, against your family, against your land, against, against your, 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 your production, and against a rivalry and, and, and an enemy threat that might be real, but that basically uh, you're also using at your own profit. And I think the way violence is actually evolving in Mexico, the way it's been spreading up and down in different territories, the way it's, it, it's, it's worrisome right now in the, in the center, in the Bajio region of Mexico, in Zacatecas, in Guanajuato, um, in the past years, shows, again, the way that you probably have a question of drugs, drug routes and drug territories and all that, like moving drugs from Mexico to the US, but also a very, very active role of criminal groups in very rich, very productive, very economically strategic regions of Mexico. The Bajio is basically um, this. And I think that's the evolution that, that, that we can see in the past 30 to 35 years, probably when the US actually, as you said, um, effectively closed the Florida route for Colombian cocaine, the way drugs went to Mexico, the way the Mexican groups empowered against um, the Colombians, and then how the evolution, and I think it's, it's very, very, very true today, goes towards this mafia, more mafia style, actually, um, criminal groups that put drugs into a very, very wider and much wider mix of activities and, 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 and revenues and source for power, corruption, and, and, and so on. Great, thank you for, for that. And I think it's great in how Mexico does or doesn't look like uh, other countries in, in the region. So going to, to you, Julie, in, in Central America, if you look at Guatemala and other Central American countries, they have been transit zones for cocaine for decades but operations have increased in, in recent years. Um, the State Department's most recent International Narcotics Strategy Control Report notes there's been a notable shift as well from maritime to air deliveries, exploiting clandestine airstrips in remote areas near the Mexican border. Um, an analysis of the most comprehensible available US data on transit zone of cocaine introduction also indicates that drug traffickers respond quickly and constantly to interdiction by shifting the routes and transport strategies. 
Can you describe how drug traffickers have been able to expand their activities in Guatemala in recent decades? Have um, enforcement and interdiction efforts elsewhere in the region had an impact on dynamics in Guatemala? And how would you describe the impact that the drug trade has had on criminal networks that exist in, in the country? Thank you. I must note that many of the routes that are being used now are routes that were used 20 or 30 years ago. The only difference is that they transport much more cocaine now than before. The socioeconomic situation of the country is crucial. That is what has been most exploited by the drug traffickers. And that's noted because, for example, in terms of air uh, transit, air shipments, well, most of this happens in very poor areas where the population is controlled and the population becomes a human shield when needed between the drug traffickers and the police and the army, giving them time to unload the aircraft in the few cases that the authorities actually reach the spot on time when the drugs are still in the airplane. But I think that what we're seeing in Central America and in Guatemala in particular is the uh, bubble effect. For example, in 2019, half of the seizures were drugs that came in by the sea by the, from the Pacific, and the other half, or perhaps 30%, was by air and the rest by land. But from in 2019 and 2020, particularly in 2019, there was a major increase in air trafficking. The I don't recall the exact percentage, but it was say 70 some percent of drugs seized that came in by air, most to the same places, the Department of the Petén in the north of Guatemala and in the Department of Retaluel, which is the south coast. In a small percentage of cases, they were able to seize drugs, this because they land in remote areas where they have enough time to offload. And when the police and the army come, sometimes the aircraft has already been destroyed and buried. And there's uh, not no sign of the cocaine. In many of these cases, we're talking about jets that can transport up to 2,000 kilograms. Now in 2020, it began to be reduced, just to give you an idea. I think that in 2020, I'm sorry, in 2019, it was uh, 50, there were 54 landings that were located by the authorities. In 2021, it fell to 39, if I've got that number right. And I'm sorry, that was one year earlier. And then it uh, reduced significantly. Last year, the air traffic, uh, diminished and deliveries by sea were on the rise. And at the same time, cocaine seizures fell. I believe this happened throughout the region uh, with some caveats. But what I'm getting at is that they are taking advantage of the country's weaknesses in respect of security. Large expanses of the territory uh, have, are not, uh, have no surveillance whatsoever or channels of corruption. This is to pick up on one of the points that was mentioned by both Ricardo and Roman. In Guatemala, what we've seen is that Drug trafficking is thinking in more corporate terms, not only to ensure the routes, but also to ensure having that they have good connections with politicians in order to secure those routes. For example, in the late 80s, early 90s, they had ties with mayors. In the last three years, we're seeing that they have ties with persons who are running for president, uh, one of whom was detained in Miami in 2019, two months before the elections, the United States accused the previous uh, vice president, uh, pre the, the, pre the vice president in the previous administration of drug trafficking, also a former minister of interior. So we're seeing a movement from the periphery to the center and perhaps to 
conclude because perhaps I've gone on excessively. Corruption was already there before drug trafficking. It's just that drug trafficking took advantage of the structures of corruption, which before might have been used for contraband and other sorts of crimes. And now there's a variety of clients. And just one of those clients is uh, drug trafficking interests. And others are uh, persons tied to other kinds of crimes, which may not may or may not be transnational. But this structure permeates the courts, the prosecutors, the police. And I'm not saying that every official is corrupt, but enough so so that or enough are to so that the drug trafficking interests can go forward in the congress there are several legislators who have been tied directly and directly to drug trafficking likewise in the central american parliament so you can see that the arrests of uh, mayors and local officials follow the uh, classic routes of drug trafficking. In most of the localities where cases of corruption have been identified and associated with uh, drug trafficking are along the south coast of the country, which are the routes, or along the borders with Honduras and El Salvador. Thank you very much, and thank I thank all three of you for that first round. Uh, I see that there are some uh, questions or comments from the public coming in. Don't worry, we're going to get to them at the end of this uh, a round of discussion. Returning back to Ricardo and picking up on what was already discussed and what you already said about the parapolitics a scandal in the first decade of the century, that revealed just how deeply rooted organized crime had become expressed in paramilitary groups, local politics in Colombia, and uh, nationally. You also spoke about how this blurring between uh, organized crime and those who live in legality was expressed in large hand, land holdings, cattle ranches, palm oil plantations, and other mega projects. Columbia Supreme Court, as an example of success that we've not seen in other countries, carried out a major investigation directed in part by Ivan Velasquez, who would then go on to head up the CCIG in Guatemala and leading to the arrests of many, uh, well, practically one third of the Colombian Congress was either in jail, being investigated or at trial. But it, if you could just say, what are some of the lessons of the parapolitics episode for current up efforts in Colombia to eliminate the influence of organized crime over the state. What was left pending of that experience and how, with what happened, is it that did, did organized crime and their allies in the state adjust as the result of so much judicial scrutiny? Well, mindful of what was noted earlier, it's been possible to observe that in the context of the armed conflict at one of the hottest moments, the paramilitary groups played a very proactive role in politics as the spearhead of the whole dynamics of the violent reorganization of land holding so as to benefit regional elites and a new dynamics of emerging elites in Colombia. Now, what happened afterwards? President Uribe then extradited paramilitary leaders to the United States, saying that they had continued engaging in criminal conduct from the prisons where they were being held. That extradition is a paradigm, as I see it, in that that strong, uh, proactive role that the paramilitary groups were playing in the context of the war was broke, and the uh, political authorities began to handle the things. At that time, the political authorities were the dominant force and were showing that they were in a position to subjugate from power those structures. So the they were sending a clear message and that apparent horizontal nature of the relationship carried over into the structures of uh, political control. Now, what does that turn mean? And what does it mean even today? 
It means that organized crime, the drug traffickers, now know that they have to negotiate with the political authorities who control the strings of illegality and that it can be manipulated against them. Let's recall the period of the cartels in Colombia. The drug traffickers sought to use force, particularly by Pablo Escobar and all of his terrorism, and also by investigate by investing in straw command companies for money laundering and that they were over and above the state or against the, going against the state now the scenario is that there is much clearer control by the political authorities by the elites who are at the helm of the state so today that relationship is set out in what I see as the most important, politically speaking, in a symbiosis between organized crime, drug trafficking, and the political authorities. And this all plays out through the financing of election campaigns. In Colombia, to uh, get elected to Congress is more and more costly because the resources needed to finance the campaigns. And the resources, well, today, drug traffickers who are laundering money and involved in this activity, they are engaged in a symbiotic relationship which they develop by financing campaigns. And the uh, politician knows that he's not gonna pay it out of his uh, pocketbook because the transaction suggests that once he gets to power, whether it's a mayor, a governor, a member of Congress, he is going to a word that uh, contracts to that source of financing, and they're going to be paid for with state uh, budgets uh, uh, out of, that is to say, out of the national budget or say royalties stemming from some activity carried out in th those territories. So when getting into this uh, transaction or compromise of, or, or deal of uh, having contracts with the state, creating uh, straw man structures, well, these end up totally laundering the financing that was carried out by the drug trafficker with the, the, uh, through the election campaign. So as I see it, well, in the past, the justice authorities did take some action going after some leaders. That doesn't mean that the system was destroyed, quite to the contrary, in response to the actions by the justice system. There's been a sort of improving the systems whereby these deals are made, which are becoming consolidated. And these systems have to do with a new dynamic of symbiosis and arrangements between the power of drug traffickers, their use of their funds to finance campaigns and the political authorities or political power, which is willing to accept such uh, financing as there is a structural problem in Colombia in terms of the deficit of democracy, where most of those elected reach power through vote buying, and those are expensive votes. And they end up uh, financing themselves with these kinds of resources. So it seems to me that there's a very important lesson here, which is that so long as one does not go to the political system, the political authorities, political power, and the processes for participation of civil society, it's going to be very difficult. Uh, Rafael Moreno, a Colombian writer, said something which is playing out now. He said that politics in Colombia is so corrupted, even corrupted drug trafficking. So today, I believe that that assessment has played out fully. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, moving on to Mexico, we see it in the elections, the same thing happens. Accusations of how organized crime infiltrates electoral processes. Uh, Romain, you had talked about this uh, before. I'm gonna do it in English because my question is written that way. <laughs> 
see violence in states like Michoacan that, that you mentioned, and it comes off as if there's a war between the state, you know, fighting drug traffickers and organized crime. But the relationship oftentimes between the state, crime, drug trafficking and violence is actually not that simple. It's not just a case of us versus them. So talk a little bit about how state actors relate to violence and crime in Mexico um, and could be on the elections or otherwise. And how does the, this drug war model, has it, has it played out in corruption and inclusion by state actors in, in Mexico? Thank you, Maureen. Again, I think it connects a lot with, um, with what Ricardo was saying about, about Colombia. And, and it's actually, I think it, it's, 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 it's actually uh, fantastic to hear um, Ricardo's analysis about, about Colombia, because I think we, we have uh, a certain amount of people uh, looking at Mexico that way, but I think we have much more to, to take and learn uh, from Colombia in terms of the systemic role played by violence in the war on drugs, but also the systemic role played by violence in politics and power um, in general. In the case of Mexico, and I think it's the case of organized crime, honestly, anywhere on, on, on the planet, I think the way to look at it is not a zero sum game. It's basically where the crime, where crime thrives, the state doesn't need to actually um, retract themselves. The state doesn't need to be absent for the crime to thrive. On the contrary, what we see is unfortunately a symbiosis, collusions, arrangements, corruption between public authorities and criminal actors. And then the complexity is even more uh, interesting and even deeper because sometimes, and it's true in, in Colombia, it's true in Mexico, and it's probably true in Guatemala as well, it happens that the same person is actually the drug boss and the political leader at the same time, right? So it's the same person, which doesn't mean that again, and as um, Julie was saying, like not all public officials are, are corrupt, but basically that violence is not an obstacle to power. I think unfortunately in Mexico, and it's it's been the case for a long time historically, but I think it's, very much the case today, violence is a resource. Violence is an asset that you can use and you can have people using it for you at your service to obtain land, power, elections, um, access to certain markets, access to avocado farms, for example, in the state of, of, of Michoacan in order to expand uh, the avocado frontier and, and produce more, which is again, like very, 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 very similar to what, what Ricardo was saying about uh, paramilitarismo and, and, and violence in, 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 in Colombia. So basically what I'm saying is the relationship between crime and politics or crime and public authorities or crime and public forces is something that I sometimes Describe as basically on Monday, you can fight. On Tuesday, you can be friends. On Wednesday, you can argue. On Thursday, you can be friends again. And on Friday, maybe you have lunch all together. So it's basically a constant negotiation. It's a constant evolution. And the issue is, again, since violence is very much seen as a resource and a cheap one, it, you're very much likely to use it to actually obtain favors and obtain more power. So in those constant negotiations between, honestly, the gray areas of politics and power and violence, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're interacting you know, with the perfect uh, drug cartel. It could mean that you're interacting with like small violent groups. You have to negotiate, but at the same time, and that's interesting, I think, and it's important to remember on, in my personal opinion, the Mexican state is not a weak state. It's not an absent uh, state. First and foremost, because we talk a lot about militarization. Well, if you think in terms of what's um, like the original state and what's probably the most emblematic characterization and embodiment of the state, the army is probably pretty much um, the basics of, of what a state is. And in Mexico, the army, but so many other public services and officials are quite present everywhere. The state is not absent. The state is actually part of a very, very 
unstable equation of negotiations, violence, repression, and political power, which is again like huge, and that goes through that way of dealing with the illicit world in Mexico through the war on drugs, basically. And I think the lens is the war on drugs and repression, basically something that, to be absolutely fair with the, 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 the current government, um, the current government was supposed to change it. I think in some ways um, it is changing some things. It's hard to actually document it because I think that the actual, the current federal government in Mexico is very jealous of, as you may know, information and access to what he's actually doing, even when he's maybe doing um, good things, for example, Sembrando Vida or Jóvenes Construyendo Futuro, which are like two enormous social programs that in part were supposed to be the, bala the, the abrazos part, sorry, of the abrazos y no balazos strategy, right? The thing is, what we see is more military power, more militarization, a stabilization of homicide rates, but a stabilization at 30,000 plus, which is like not a great news. And we don't see, or we're not able to fully document what's going on in terms of the abrazo part. So unfortunately, we're still stuck with the war on drugs strategy. We're still stuck probably um, with the same approach to public security the weakening of civilian responses, the weakening of police forces with all the, you know, again, like the defects, of course, of the police forces in Mexico. But what we would like to see is a deep change in the, in the strategy um, and, and, and something that goes out of the war on drugs strategy. Because again, what's, what's complicated with the war on drugs, it, it, I think it's, it's, it's a self-reinforcing argument that basically people tell you there is violence in your country, the state is absent. So the response is more state in terms of more firepower. So you keep on feeding the loop of more war on drugs, more military. And again, and I will finish on, on, on that, it's, it's, it's somehow counterintuitive and, and extremely challenging, I guess, for us advocating for something different is that people ask for military intervention in, in, in Mexico. And it is the most trustable and the most trusted public institution today, which is a huge intellectual and, and, and concrete challenge, honestly, if we want to change uh, things. Thank you. And we could have a whole other conversation as Romain knows I cover the Mexico program for, for over a decade at WOLA on just this issue. I'd happily put it for another topic for another, another day. I, I found it um, Yamativo to the, the concept of violence as a cheap resource, especially looking at the tens of thousands of victims in, in Mexico. And so how much you know, this, this has become a, a, a very tragic you know, resource as well. Um, and I think some of this is similar, Julie, to, to, to Guatemala. You have um, described in the past that Guatemala is a state fighting two wars, one with organized crime and one with itself. Um, December last year, there were three members of the military who were arrested because of their in links with the Mexican cartel, um, Jalisco Nueva Generación, for example. So can you describe in, in Guatemala's case how organized crime incorporates not only these foreign criminal networks and local criminal organizations, but also local authorities, the military, police, and civilians into its activities? And in linked, because I think especially in, in Central America, you have so many countries that have gone through internal conflicts. So in the case of Guatemala, what has been, what is the role of the legacy of Guatemala's internal conflict played in sustaining these networks operations? I will try to do an executive summary of everything that you have asked me because it's a long history. In any case, organized crime, drug traffickers and their linkages with authorities started during the armed conflict approximately in the 1980s when the army had controlled the national territory. There was a series of military regimes. And that is when we see that first contact Obviously, later on, there's a transition. I mean, we need to remember that the armed forces also controlled borders in certain areas, specifically where there was greater activity by the guerrilla uh, 
then a transition took place towards civilian governments, but the links continue. In fact, some of the civilians that participated in militia-style operations against insurgents were rewarded with certain positions on the borders, and then they were identified as actually very large drug traffickers, and some of them have been extradited to the United States. I'm talking about Arnaldo Vargas, who was a mayor in Secapa on the border with Honduras, and he was arrested in 90, extradited in, 90, in 1990, extradited in 1992. And after 18 years in prison, he participated in the elections. He was going to win, but luckily his uh, candidacy was canceled. But right now he is actually part of a local government. There are other cases such as the Lorenzala family, one of the most well-known families that was disarmed due to extraditions. But these structures actually prevailed. And here I would like to introduce a concept uh, which is the monopoly of violence. These groups created monopolies of violence and violence control in different parts of the country. Some actually since the time of the conflict, the internal conflict, others later on. So regardless of how the dynamic, uh, the drug trafficking dynamic would unfold, these structures adapted. They had to do with transportation and storage of drugs. These structures already have very important contacts with local authorities, connections, and it was some sort of outsourcing or middlemen with larger drug traffickers. These groups, for example, could have started to drug trafficking with the Golfo cartel when the Golfo cartel was, or the Gulf cartel was um, stronger. And then they moved on to the Sinaloa cartel and then the Jalisco Nueva Generación cartel. They were first trafficking in the case of Colombia, actually with the Medellin cartel and then later on with the Cali cartel and so on and so forth. Because these were very local structures controlling local power with very strong links with local leaders, including political leaders such as mayors of congressmen, they managed to actually prevail and stay as part of power structures for decades. In addition to this, they actually moved from the periphery to the center. We were talking before about mayors, and now we are talking about presidential candidates. And I wanted to say something that Ricardo mentioned before regarding the financing of electoral campaigns for the CC. This was the beginning of their and at least one of the factors. This candidate, Mario Estrada, who was arrested in Miami in May 2019, allegedly it was because he was trying to interact with some Sinaloa cartel members. He wanted some funding for his campaign, but in the conversation, he said that he had already been approached by the Jalisco Nueva Generación cartel. We don't know if it was a bluff or if it actually happened, but I think it's quite surprising that two years later, in December of last year, these three military members were arrested because of links to the Jalisco Nueva Generación cartel. Whether it was a bluff or not, it's clear then that this group also had connections with certain authorities in Guatemala in order to make sure that they could land their planes that were coming from South America and that were transported drugs towards Mexico. And in this regard, they start establishing those connections and they actually use their connections in different and take advantage of them in different ways in terms of operations, but also with politicians. And the last thing that I would like to say 
is that there was a political science specialist in Guatemala that said that it was hard or difficult to talk about Guatemala, just saying that it was undergoing a Mexicanization or Colombianization, which was said when the CETA, CETAs entered uh, Guatemala a few years back. Violence or whatever happens depends on the dynamic between drug traffickers and authorities. And it is not the same in Colombia, Mexico, or in Guatemala, even though there are certain common aspects. Here in Guatemala, and I don't know if it's the same in Mexico, the absence of violence means that there is an equilibrium in the in terms of violence and when such monopoly is broken that's when violence starts happening because they're fighting with each other over territories different territories there are other structures that are more horizontal therefore you don't see the same type of violence and now to wrap up i would just like to say that for example on the border between mexico and guatemala we've seen less violence historically although we saw a lot last year, because there are less drug trafficking groups than on the border with Honduras and El Salvador. That is one of the reasons why, for example, someone from the prosecutor's office said that more violence is seen on the southern border. In the border with El Salvador rather than Honduras, because most of the Lorenzana group has been extradited and only medium level and low level leaders were left. And another very important factor in terms of destabilization was the coming of the Jalisco Nueva Generación cartel, who is which is using very similar routes to the ones used by the Zetas in 2010, Honduras, Sabal, then the Northern area to go into Mexico and then Guatemala. Thank you. Thank you. It's so important to see the similarities among the countries as well as their different realities. And perhaps uh, Romain will have more to say about the uh, question of non, uh, the absence of violence, uh, representing that there's some uh, kind of agreement uh, or not much of a dispute over territory, say, in Chiapas for example. Now, one more round. There's any number of uh, questions uh, from the public, so please try to be brief in this last part. We're trying to now look to the future, thinking also about this new administration in the United States. So I'll switch to English. Evidence-based treatment as a top drug policy priority. There is an executive order now on a U.S. Council on Transnational Organized Crime. There is a Biden administration as a national strategy to counter corruption. In spite of all of that, I think you look at drug prohibition as a model is still very much intact as the underlying framework of drug policy in the United States and around the world. So in US federal government discourse, the sheer fact of prohibition is virtually invisible. There's a, you know, the only real exception is these congressional initiatives to dismantle the prohibition of cannabis, as many US states have already done. So in this context, we can expect that the, illicit, the illegal drug trade will continue generating enormous profits that facilitate corruption and empower organized crime in Latin America and, and throughout the world. So now we want to look at more what can and should be done and what does this mean for, for cooperation um, between the US and, and the region. So Ricardo, uh, a last question for you. Um, La administración de Biden busca adoptar un enfoque más holístico. The Biden administration is seeking to pursue a more holistic approach to drug supply reduction. Its documents mention helping to increase state presence and services in ungoverned rural areas. Nonetheless, the brief overview of the new strategy put out by the White House doesn't mention the word corruption. It's very likely that Colombia's security forces are going to be a central part of this strategy given the very close relationship that exists. Now, taking into account the corruption associated with organized crime in Colombia, is it possible that this new strategy will meet with success? Does the government of the United States understand the extent of uh, the relationships in between Colombia's military and police partners and organized crime? 
And other than abandoning a prohibition framework, what else can the US government do to help those in Colombia who want to reduce organized crimes, influence uh, over politics, the legal economy, and the security forces? The question includes so many aspects that I'm going to just have to lay out a few basic points, and then perhaps in the Q&A we'll be able to develop it a, little, a bit further. First point, nowadays, the context of the drug war in Colombia has an objective, which is to reduce supply. And this supply reduction is basically limited to crops for illicit use. In other words, the demands that the United States makes on Colombia are percentage reductions of areas of crops as the key uh, most crucial aspect of that relationship. In other words, it is an approach that creates a narrative that directly associates drug trafficking with the crops of which illicit use is made. And it is set forth in most of the financing of the United States in its uh, war on drugs is basically geared to establishing military bases that are associated with forced manual eradication or in the past contributing to aerial spraying by financing all of the services uh, required in such a strategy. So that's a, the, a first point, that in the context of the US-Columbia relationship, that aspect continues to hold sway, not just corruption, but a uh, practical ignoring of all of the uh, new dynamics and drug trafficking structures. And the fact that the cocaine market has expanded so much worldwide, yet there is not knowledge of what are the routes, who controls them. There's also been a very intense process of getting Brazil out through Brazil, through Ecuador, through the Pacific to uh, China, through Venezuela, and so on. So all of this aspect of new uh, markets is practically unknown by the Colombian authorities and by the context of the U.S. Colombia relationship, which is only looking to reduce areas of crops. That's the first point. Now, second, I totally share Roman's interpretation or understanding of the issue of the state. I think that's an extremely important uh, discussion. It could be subject matter for another event. I distinguish mafia from organized crime. That is to say, every mafia is not organized crime, but not all organized crime is mafia. And it's very important to understand the concept of mafia technically in order to better understand the situation of Colombia. In other words, in Colombia, what we see is an elite with an illegal origins, which who are on the way to legalizing and who today control political power and have controlled political power for a long time. And that mafia, which has certain advantages, such as when I spoke about the extradition of the paramilitaries, which was basically done to cover, to limit the possibility of finding out the full truth of all the activities carried out by these groups. These mafia-like practices have to do with mechanisms for using protection violence, which is used in Colombia today to guarantee the counter agrarian reform, which is calculated to have reached more than 6 million hectares. That reform is protected with protection violence that includes the participation of the police and the armed forces. So there is a practice which from the standpoint of the monopoly of force by the state is not in the general interest, but rather is catering to private interests. Also, uh, this, the, the question also talks on, uh, touches on whether the United States understands the relationship. I would say it's much more complex than the possibility of organized crime corrupting the state. Here, there are more elements present that make it, it all the more complex that need to be taken into account to understand that relationship. Those mafia-like practices also have to do with an practically absolute power in 
the regions outside of the context of uh, or the framework of the constitution and the law. And there's a capacity there for combining the legal with the illegal. We could say that there is a power that has been using legal mechanisms set out in the constitution, yet at the same time has developed mechanisms in which one uses force, blackmail, in order to secure the objectives they seek. Now, we already talked about elections where there is a whole uh, mafia-like apparatus having to do with illegal practices in relation to elections. And during the current period, it is being announced that such mechanisms are being activated and there are regional elites who are going to seek to make their way into Congress or the presidency once again, drawing on such mechanisms where this whole apparatus with the participation of illegal funds is involved. Illegal guarantees uh, for money laundering, contraband always needs protection. The protection can be done from different parts of, uh, is provided from different parts of the state. And the protection that is provided by the armed forces and the police in relationship with the private benefits that I was just mentioning have to do with the ability of the uh, political agents who have developed mafia-like practices and the police and army. Uh, this all involves promotions. If a uh, total defense of violence in response to certain things, for example, the social protests uh, in throughout the middle of last year. So in that context, let's look at this in relation to the United States. And the United States continues to develop a narrative in which it attributes all of the drug trafficking power and organized crime to corruption. We're saying, wait a minute, what's here is a very complex political process having to do with Ill illegal forces that have control over the state, developing very complex dynamics in which the exercise of their political power is entailed. So combining legality and illegality and also redefining the role of the armed forces to private benefits. So in the dialogue with the United States, I would say that the topic of drug trafficking, drug trafficking organizations and the knowledge of what's happening at that level needs to be put on the table. And likewise, Colombia's capacity and offices such as the prosecutorial authorities and the justice authorities to take stock of these processes. There's not a rigorous knowledge of these dynamics that are unfolding in the country and that are resulting in a greater world supply of cocaine. It has to do with reformulating the whole question of the role of the armed forces and the police. This, is, this topic is very complex. And there, the United States is key because the United States practically reduces the role of the uh, armed forces and the police to military bases, uh, promoting promotions uh, where there have been crop eradications, and there's not knowledge of the dynamics that I point out having to do with drug trafficking. And I believe that the United States, I think Washington uh, knows what's happening here with the elite that has mafia-like practices. It is aware that many members of that elite are involved in money laundering. And the best expression of this was the case of Yenye Hernandez. He was a uh, cattleman and it was clear that he financed the campaign of President Duque, the current president. Nonetheless, there's been no investigation into this. The oversight of the Office of the Comptroller, of the Human Rights Ombudsman, of the Prosecutor, of the Inspector General means that impunity has reigned. The United States has been silent about all of this. So the core of the matter really is requiring that Washington or getting Washington to take on these circumstances and not simply say so easily that corruption uh, that drug trafficking uh, corrupts the institutions. That's an easy narrative and it avoids getting, uh, and it, it is tantamount to avoiding get in, to getting into the complexity of the interrelation among all these forces. Thank you very much, Ricardo. And thinking about the time, and I think that you can 
look at the questions and answer uh, the questions in the Q and A. Uh, some are for some of you, and some are for others. But precisely thinking about one of the questions, and to close out in the case of Mexico. Of his presidential campaign, yet real progress has been slow, and what we saw as once promising anti corruption efforts have languished. So, Romain, how can Mexico move forward in reducing corruption and collusion? And this was also linked to a question made by uh, one of the someone in the audience about what would a deep change in strategy really mean for, for Mexico? And then the second part, obviously, short answers, right? Uh, what, where do you view U.S. cooperation on this area within the new bicentennial framework for cooperation? It does mention co cooperation in reducing transnational criminal organizations' drug sales capacity and prosecuting corruption cases. So what do you think the U.S. role can be or should be in addressing some of these you know, broader corruption issues in Mexico? Thank you, Maureen. I think I will answer your question and, 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 and yes, try to integrate answers to some of the questions and, and, and comment. Um, to, one, to one question that was mentioning a strong state or a weak state, um, so there is no misunderstanding and, and Ricardo mentioned, mentioned that as well. I think Mexico has a very strong state um, and having a very strong state in, in multiple dynamics, right? Um, I think the main issue today, and it goes to the first part of your question, as well as, as, as the second one, a strong Mexican state should probably put all his efforts today in a justice system that actually works. Um, I think the public security has been you know, the focus. Um, and of course, it's fundamental that you have a public security strategy, but I think there is so much investment and expertise in the public security strategy that we probably will see um, something going on forever and ever. I mean, public security in Mexico works also almost by itself somehow with all the defects and all, all the things that we could improve. But the justice system is, uh, unfortunately, in terms of corruption, in, term, in general terms, um, almost non-existent. And I think what, what, what is extremely worrisome and what connects um, the Guatemalan case, the Colombian case, the Italian case, as was mentioned in, in, in one question, I, and I, I, I truly agree, um, is that at some point you need a state response in terms of the justice system and in terms of the limit you put to what's actually uh, tolerated in terms of violence, corruption, and what you can do in the licit, illicit world, basically. If you don't set up some rules, um, it's very, very hard that, that, that you address the structural issue of, of violence in a country. And I think, uh, and of course, like it's Italy and, 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 and Guatemala and Colombia um, have um, been facing tremendous challenges in terms of the, the, the justice system and the response you can give um, to mafia organized crime and, and, and this world that, that Ricardo and, and Julie were, were, were mentioning. But if we don't see a very strong and strict and you know total response from the state at some point i think we won't be seeing an actual structural improvement maybe homicides and i hope homicides will keep on going down in in mexico although today the reduction is extremely um weak um and we can't really we're not fully able honestly in in perfect objective terms we're not really able to say if it's the result of the public strategy, which is like, is it like the abrazos part? Is it the balazos part? Like it's very hard to, to actually tell, but we will not be seeing uh, a full reduction in homicides and violence in general if there is no justice response. And I think in that sense, what the US cooperation and what the Mexico US uh, new framework for cooperation and different, um, dynamics, security dynamics, and, 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 and so on, um, the, the bicentennial uh, framework that you were mentioning, I think that's where, and I truly hope it's the case, the US and Mexico should be talking more about the justice system and actually making sure that besides a couple of very, even like mediatic and attractive corruption cases, that sometimes we see that some things, something might be happening and then it goes down and, and, and the case never 
uh, never goes anywhere. I think in structural terms, the best investment today to do in, in, in Mexico in terms of cooperation is really the justice system that has to work. Like if there is no judicial response to what's going on in the country, I think it keeps on feeding the fact that as we were mentioning in the beginning, violence is very cheap to use. Like in cheap in terms of the price you have to pay for obtaining certain things, but also the consequences almost non-existent basically. Like the level of impunity in Mexico is still basically the same around 98, 99% uh, in, 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 depending on, on which, which type of crime you, 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 you watch on. But it means that basically there is absolutely no consequence in terms of justice to whatever uh, crime you're, you are actually committing or felony you're, you're actually committing. So I think it has to be the access of, of cooperation and investment. And I hope what has been um, announced in terms of you know, the change of strategy and the term of in, even the symbolic aspect of the cooperation and, and you know, human rights and, and a more balanced uh, way of doing things in, between Mexico and the US actually works, actually goes somewhere. And, and, but I think that the right focus today is, 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 really, is really justice. Thank you, Romain. And it's, uh, for speaking on wool, it's one of the, the priorities that we've certainly pushed forward in terms of US cooperation for, for actually since the media initiative started as well in terms of the, the really importance of looking at, at the justice system and combating impunity, which is linked to the last question that I had for you, Julie, as well, because after dismantling the Commission to Combat Impunity in Guatemala, the CCIG in 2019, we have seen further steps taken by the government to erode anti-corruption efforts, including last year, the illegal removal of the country's top anti-corruption prosecutor and a recent request by the Guatemalan Attorney General to lift the impunity, immunity sorry, of one of the leading anti-corruption judges in the country. You had told me as well that even with the CC, the Guatemalan justice system was confronted with challenges in investigating organized criminal cases and internal corruption within the judiciary. So what does the CCIG's absence and these additional measures that have been taken to undermine judicial in the institutions mean for these criminal groups and clandestine structures that are operating currently in Guatemala? And then linked to the US, you know, what implications do the Gemete government's actions to undermine the rule of law have on you know, possibilities of US cooperation and the Biden administration's stated commitment to fighting corruption? Okay, I will try to be brief, but starting with the question about the CC, when the CC started achieving good results, and it's not that they didn't achieve any good results in the past, but the key results were achieved in 2016 to 2019, and that's one of the reasons why pressure increased in order to remove the mission from the country. I think the strongest message in favor of impunity was that the CICIG was uh, removed and that it was followed up with other actions such as the dismissal of the chief of the prosecutor's office against impunity as well as other things like the attorney general, how the attorney general get uh, her position. She plagiarized her PhD thesis and nothing happened whatsoever. Those could be very silly examples. There are others um, about judges and people in key positions where certain things were found out. For example, they submitted their CV with certain titles that they were never that they never got. And I think that's a um, very strong message that they can do whatever and nothing happens to them and other people that are lower in the corruption chain or in terms of organized crime they receive the same message my personal impression is that at least regarding biden's administration there have been contradictory messages First, they announced the withdrawal of U.S. assistance to the public ministry after the attorney general fired the 
prosecutor against impunity. And then she was included in a list of the most corrupted authorities in the region. And then uh, the president said in December that Guatemala is the only ally of the US in Central America. And then the US embassy published a tweet congratulating the national police for the captures of the extra table. So I don't know, it sounds a little bit bipolar to me, and maybe I'm reducing this to a very simple example, but the idea is that you can't really have a hostile foreign policy completely against the government and the Ministry of Defense, but I wanted to mention what Jennifer Strimmer said, who is an anthropologist and a political science expert. In the 90s, the US wanted to continue to pull the armed forces and bring them to a great area. And it was really hard to take them out of there through the peace accords. The structure against the insurgency by the military and the police was what being used in order to fight regional groups and regional threats such as migration and drug trafficking. And there were certain groups within the army that made up a, an anti-drug command that was working closely with the DEA at the end of the 1990s and recently we saw joint task forces that were created with police and the military in order to fight against drug trafficking on the border and the southern coast. However, the issue is that the white elephant in the room is not addressed. Corruption. Two positive signs, I would say, is that these military were arrested in December, even though there was no extradition request. The norm is that no big drug trafficker is arrested unless there's an extradition request, but these were an exception. And there was also an arrest and sentenced of a mayor. He was sentenced in December. There was no extradition request either. And this takes me to the issue of impunity. There's a question about impunity by one of the participants, and that's the thing. Most of the people that are extradited, they do their sentence, they get a 75% discount in their sentence, they go back to uh, their country of origin and nothing happens. They go back to being criminals. I think someone did, was sentenced to 22 years. They were in prison for 12, and then they went back to Guatemala. They started drug trafficking again, and then they were extradited again. So there is a great issue with impunity that is really affecting us. And I understand it's very hard for Biden's administration to address this issue. In all the reports by the Department of State regarding on drugs that were published in March, there was some message saying that they will not be able to control drug trafficking if they don't, if there's no control over corruption of public authorities. But the current administration is really not doing much in that sense. They have a very easy narrative. They blame drug trafficking for corruption. And of course, drug trafficking contributes to corruption, but it's not the root cause of it. So the situation is highly complex, and I understand that we need a multi-stakeholder effort and a local effort to address it. And the local effort is quite hard to carry out, considering that the main courts in the country are under their control, and the executive is really not showing any signs of being willing to seriously combat corruption. And let me give you an example. They arrested, I think, 54, 56 um, people that were going to be extradited. There was a request of extradition by the US. That's a record. However, Honduras arrested half of those. They seized one third more 
cocaine than Guatemala. So those arrests are irrelevant or rather maybe they're important, but they're not that key. Basically what I want to say is that the government is not being serious in terms of addressing corruption and that maybe what we need is a much more nuanced discussion in the US about how to address this very complex issue and also more consistent actions uh, so that you don't congratulate the police on the one hand and at the same time you are withdrawing funds from the public ministry. Thank you, Julie, for answering some of the questions that were posed also by our audience. We are running out of time. We have just a few minutes left. I think we're going to go a little beyond 12. Thank you to the interpreters for being willing to stay just a few minutes more. In any case, to wrap up, I would like to address some questions. There are questions about whether if drug traffickers use violence, why are they not classified as terrorists? Another one about how about drug trafficking and their links with the, those that are involved in human trafficking. And there's another more general question that has to do with the expansion of illicit activity in the export of different products, avocado, lemons, palm oil, and how much is this linked to foreign export companies? There, I hope Ricardo and Romain can read some of the questions. I think Romain has answered some of them already, maybe a more general one. And I will now offer the floor to each one of you for five minutes, but it's about how certain illicit substances could be imported to uh, certain things that have been done in the US could be exported to Colombia as well as other countries. So in any case, first, thank you to those that post all these questions. I hope we can answer them. We will have a last round for with three or four minutes per speaker to wrap up. Ricardo? Yes, I would like to answer some of the questions that have been posed. We've seen the function of the money by drug trafficking when they go back to export countries such as Colombia and how they get inserted in a political and economic model. That is a key aspect. From an economic standpoint here, it has to do mainly with accumulation of lands and how it strengthens a model where we export products such as palm oil and other agricultural products. We see certain investments, which in my opinion are a priority. They're a strategic objective. And Jorge Paladines was asking a question about such investments strengthen certain routes or not. And I would say not necessarily, that's not a priority. The priority is to launder the money to strengthen a, as an elite with a very strong local power. And that has happened in Colombia without any type of obstacles and such investments, such model where we see an accumulation of land and defense of the agrarian reform is supported with a combination of use of force, protection of legal money once the, the money laundering has taken place. And then also transactions with armed groups such as the Gulf cartel or the self-defense uh, groups. They play a key role as a service provider of protection services to the communities. They're asking for land restitution and agrarian reform and so on and so forth. And then in addition to this, the armed forces, the police are involved in this type of transaction. They are protecting private property and 
that was developed by the process of accumulation of lands, which in um, practical terms, uh, we are actually talking about money laundering. In Colombia, then we have a, an, another very important source of money laundering, which is smuggling of goods. And this is one of the main revenues source. There is a high level of informality in certain cities, such as Cucuta, we're talking about almost 70%, in Bogota, 48, 50% of the economic activity. So this type of trafficking of smuggling is a very important activity as another source of money laundering, and also to have a great deal of control over the population, impact on the population. There are different cases in Catatumbo where we see fincas, farms that are part of it in Venezuela, part of it in Colombia, and they're used to cross the border and move drugs. And that has to do with the question of paladines. And then we also know that in terms of the agro-industry, some of the routes that are used to move this legal production could also be used and in fact have been used in order to export products. In Antioquia and Colombia, we are directly connected with Guatemala and we've seen this connectivity when we see those pilots that were that crashed actually in the pilots were providing services to transport President Uribe, President Duque during their campaign. So we see a link between these airlines, these pilots that are very trustworthy and the political power. In that sense, we see a very clear connection. And then finally, another key point, Julie talked about the return of drug traffickers, and that's something very important. We are seeing this process in Colombia. We see very low sentences in Colombia for many of the drug traffic traffickers from five to 10 years, and they come back. And what they do is to actually either get involved in drug trafficking again or something different. The money that they accumulated is inserted in the economic and political transformation process. So we're talking about people that could actually contribute to strengthening the elite that has the political power. For example, there is someone who has been promoted to Congress at this point. There are some denounces that um, force is being used so that people vote for them. There are people that are recovering the control of the territory. And this has to do with the accumulation of land and different type of dynamics in Colombia, where we see accumulation of land and then appropriation of these businesses. So finally, I think here there is something very clear. In the case of marijuana, we've seen some progress in the United States as well as in other parts of the world. But what happens with cocaine in our case, this is our main problem. And the situation is not so simple. If we regulate weed, we're not going to get to regulate cocaine. And we need to do something in that regard so that we put cocaine um, in the center of the international discussion about this, we need to renew our perspective. We need to see how the international community can address the problems caused by drug trafficking in countries such as Colombia. Thank you very much, Ricardo. Roman? Um, in terms of legalizing drugs, I think it can't hurt, honestly. Um, I mean, we could probably talk a lot on about, you know, the marijuana legalization in Mexico. It's a law that it was supposed to pass. It's not passing. It's not going anywhere. It's a promise. Um, the complexity of the drug market, what could happen 
badly in general, but I think again, like legalizing and working towards something that is uh, just more, probably more efficient or at least trying it uh, couldn't hurt. At the same time, as Ricardo was saying, and, 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 and you guys at Walla have been working a lot on this as well, like it's, it's no silver, silver bullet at all, right? Um, what we've, we've been discussing for the past hour and a half, I think it's, um, is in the case of Mexico, the lack of strong and sustainable public institutions in so many different aspects that has to do, that have to do with public security or justice or, um, you know, fighting corruption. The thing is you have institutions, um, Mexico is very good at creating new institutions. It's um, the country or the, the governments uh, are very, are much weaker in terms of sustaining them first, uh, providing them with the proper resources to work and the independence, the need to actually work afterwards. So basically you could imagine a system that legalized certain drugs, for example, the thing is if after that, you don't have the institutional design and support for the system to actually work, it's probably going to feed again what we've been discussing, like corruption, uh, systemic corruption, impunity, and opportunities for gray markets to actually thrive on um, the overlaps and 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 and, and different holes that that are in the in the legal markets. Um, and I think it's probably a question that actually relates, and I will finish finish on that to be to 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 remain short um, to the question on on agribusiness and, and avocado and limes and, and so many other industries. And I think it, again, it connects a lot with the Colombian case is that in Mexico, some of the most powerful regions in terms of agro industry, and we're talking billions of legal uh, dollars industry uh, per year, are also some of the most emblematic regions for drug production, drug trafficking, and drug cartels in terms of criminal activities being extremely sophisticated. It's Sinaloa, it's Michoacan, it's Jalisco to a certain extent. Again, it's the Bajio region. So basically, and Ricardo was mentioning it, I think the, the licit, illicit relationships between the agribusiness industry and criminal groups in general, or just illicit interests in general, are extremely intertwined, which is not, again, like very... Um, original or very surprising. It happens in so many different places in the world, not only in, 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 in Latin America in this case. But what we see is that basically very high levels of violence and very spectacular levels of violence like Michoacan, for example, for the past 10 to 15 years are not, again, an obstacle to thriving profit and thriving agribusiness industry. The lime industry, the avocado industry, the berries industry in Michoacan is in a constant boom as violence is in a constant boom. So there, I think there is something that we have to address. We have to disentangle how basically violence, again, is not an obstacle to a system that sometimes works with violence, sometimes allows for very high levels of violence and sometimes needs or uses violence, again, as a resource to, for example, expand avocado production in Michoacan, which is a, a very concerning reality right now. So again, I think we have to address the systemic um, causes of violence and, and coming back to the, to, to, to the issue, I think the, the, the justice response to it combined with a civilian public security response is at least the bet uh, we're trying to advocate for. Muchas gracias. Última palabra, Juli. Uh, sí. bueno. Thank you very much, Julie, with the last word. Well, I don't think one can talk about decriminalization of drugs without mentioning the case of 2012 of then President Perez Molina. He began his administration talking about decriminalization, but it was just a show because there was never a single serious conversation about the issue. He just put it out and then everybody began to uh, spin their arguments in favor and against, and it really turned out to be a smokescreen while a, a regressive tax reform was passed in the Congress while everyone else was carrying on about decriminalization of drugs. I don't think it's a black and white issue. And I think it requires attention. But as someone mentioned, 
it can't work in Latin America if it's not done in the United States, which is the main market. Well, first the United States and then Europe. It wouldn't work. But moreover, there are other problems. It's no secret. It won't be just in, it's not just Guatemala, it's also other countries. The drug trafficking routes generally leave uh, routes together with uh, retail narco uh, drug dealing and it generates consumption where there's no control. In Guatemala, there's no attention to drug addicts or practically none. It's, there's not even information about the problem. There are surveys that determine the level of drug consumption, but only among school children. Uh, in terms of adults, there's practically no knowledge about it. So if, for example, if it's going to be decriminalized, that's going to create other problems, at least in Guatemala, a country where well, it, it, it barely is able to take care of kidney patients or HIV patients, and so much less will it be able to take care of persons who have problems of addiction. But it does have to be a subject for serious discussion, especially involving the United States. Now, the subject of marijuana, well, it's uh, really uh, irrelevant to what might happen with cocaine. Naturally, there is a market for consumption, but where one finds most violence and most corruption is around cocaine and other drugs, not so much marijuana. I did want to address what uh, was mentioned about classifying the most violent drug trafficking groups as terrorists. Actually, in the case of Guatemala, that's a cosmetic change that has no impact. For example, in the case of the gangs, uh, the Barrio 18 and the Marasal Batrucha, which have been designated as terrorist organizations by the United States, if I'm not mistaken. Well, that has had zero impact here. In Guatemala, there's been discussion of the Congress uh, naming them as terrorist organizations. That would also have uh, zero impact because of corruption and because the failure to go after the problem at its roots, it just wouldn't work. The other issue is that the prisons are, have more people who have trafficked in marijuana than cocaine. According to one source from the prosecutor's office, the ones who traffic in cocaine have enough money to pay off corrupt judges. And so they have this economic situation that allows them to merge free. And there is a saturation of the prisons. And this problem was mentioned at the outset of our conversation. But as in other cases, it, uh, the ones who are caught uh, or, or who stay and remain in prison are the ones who don't have the money to get out. So the impact of classifying them as terrorist groups would be very limited. And the issue of decriminalization of marijuana and subsequently cocaine, I don't think would have any consequence unless that begins to be done in the United States. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julie, uh, Romain, and Ricardo for your time and experience. We'd also like to thank the interpreters for their support today. And we'd like to thank all of you for having been with us today. We hope that we've been able to answer your questions. I think it's, it was a very rich discussion, also with many points still pending. So I would just like to highlight that the last webinar in this series will be held on 9 March. And we'll be sending out the invitation, and that is on the impact of the drug war on human rights violations. We hope to see you then as well. Thank you all so much, and good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation. It's been a pleasure to participate. Likewise, thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you. So long, everyone.